Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening, St. Joseph and everybody in Facebook land. I hope you had a great day. Oh, yes. If it was trying, if it was a trying day, thank God for it because he brought you through it. Right. Thank him for it. And it's been a trying day, so just thank him for it. This is our Wednesday night Bible study and prayer meeting. Uh, we're going to have a prayer. We're going to our prayer list. Our prayer is first that we can uh, do like we did back when I first got there. Have a Bible study in-house. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to definitely put that on number one on my prayer list. That we can be in-house. And we can fellowship and, and be amongst the family. Amen. Amen. Then our prayer list is on our prayer list today. We have Michael Sean Boatwright, Sister Alberta Bowden, Brother Willie Braggs, and Sister Andy Chooks, who just walked in the house. Amen. Amen. Brother Terrence Brooks, Sister Carolyn, and DeAndre Campbell, Sister Kate Carroll, Sister Blondina, and Herbert Caswell. The Children's Youth Department Ministry, Cora Clayton. Deacon Rodney Collins and family, Daryl Cole, Denise Cooley and family, Master Trey Crocker, the son of Therese, uh, Denise Steeles, Sister Mary Kerr, Brother Richard and Teresa Curry and family, Blanche Day and family, Inez Drain, mother of sisters Norma Shepherd, Preston and Bernice Drummer, Brother Holbert and Reginald Fitzpatrick, Sister Otha Frazier, Brother Otis Glover, Brother Ivory Godwin, Shirley Green and Elsa Norwood, Sister uh, Carolyn Simmons, Sister Michelle Rooms, Antonio and Stephanie and Leonard Hackley, Sister Cora Hackley, Marjorie Holton and family, Vanetta Jackson, the jail ministry, uh, Takaya Jones and family, Ernest Morrell, husband of sister Yvonne Morrell, the Jefferson and Pearson family, Ronald Lee, Brother James LeCount, Brother Adrian and Stanley Limerick, Antoinette Lovely and family, Sister Phyllis Lucky, Tondalia Manny, Brother Larry McKenzie, Daphne Mitchell, Sister Daphne Mitchell, Sister Hilda Myers, Brother D'Angelo Parker, Daisha Peterson, Sister Beatrice, Sister BB, and Brother Bentley Porter, Lawrence Raheem, uh, Tay Reed and family, Sister Elizabeth Robinson, Sister Brenda Sapp, Sister Bertha Scott, Carmen Small, Sister of Teresa Curry. Our Deacon, Deacon Ralph Smith, Brother Richard and Sister Easter Sneed, Patrilla, Darrell Jr., and Shalithia Stringfield, Brother Michael Sutton, Shikari, and Tony and Trey Sutton, Sister Valencia Sutton, Sister Peggy Thompson and family, Bobby Tucker Jr., Sister Hattie Wallace and Quentin Wallace, April Weaver, friend of Sister Melanie Tapley, Kadeep Williams, Thomas Wilson, Brother uh, brother Harry uh, Wilson, Brother Bobby Wright and family, Linda Wright, Travis Wright and family. And we have a note here, Sister Toby Thorpes will have a medical procedure on Friday, February the 12th. Let's keep her listed up in our in our. Let's pray for St. Joseph that we can get back in the Wednesday night Bible study. Amen. Amen. But this is this is where you can ask all the questions that you want to ask. You can raise your hand and I can tell you, Pastor, do have an answer for you. I'm going to be reading Isaiah 40, which was stuck on my mind from Sunday service. Listen at what he says about even this prelude, St. Joseph. 
Have you not known? Have you not heard? The, level, the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of all the ends of the earth. Neither faints nor is weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the weak. Yeah. And to those who have no might, he increases strength. Even the youth shall not shall faint yes. and be weary. And the young men shall utterly fail. Here we are. But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up, as our pastor said, on the wings like an eagle. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Father, we thank you today for Jesus the author and the finish of our faith, knowing that without him we can do absolutely nothing. It's because of him that we are here tonight because we mounted up. Yes. We got up and we moved according to the way your spirit led us, led us to move. So we thank you for that. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for breathing on us to be obedient to you. Thank you, Father. In the power of your Holy Spirit. Forgive us of our sins as only you can. Anoint us afresh so we can hear from you tonight again. Yes, Lord. And then breathe on the angel of this house. The Reverend Dr. E.C. Gregory, Ph.D. Touch him in a mighty way, Lord, so he can teach us about these end times. We see it happening all around us. So you are preparing us for what's to come. So for that, we are so grateful and we thank just say you, thank you. Bless us now, Lord. Open up our hearts to receive your word tonight. If there's anybody in the sound of his voice that won't, that don't know Jesus in the pardon of their sin, I pray that they would just come and say yes to Jesus. Thank you now. Breathe on us now. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you, my brother. Thank you. God has blessed us to be here another Wednesday night. And I pray that God will continue touching hearts and blessing us to where we can hear about what he has in store for us. Times are getting tough. Yeah. I'm telling you, times yeah. are getting tough. And so we need to look at what God has in store and what God has for us to do. Uh, and he has a lot for us. Those of us who are children of God, when the end time comes, we will be raptured. But Thank you. those that uh, are on the fence, playing the game, walking around, just being church members, I'm out. God says that's, that's not who he's looking for. Yeah. He's looking for those who are truly born again with, 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 with their faith and trust in him. Yeah. And so the end times, are going, it's going to be a horrible time. It's going to be a time when God is going to bring about his, his judgment on, on mankind. Uh, I want us to keep in mind as we go through this, keeping in mind, first of all, that, uh, that image that we talked about in uh, Daniel chapter 2, uh, that Nebuchadnezzar uh, just poked his nose at, made the whole image himself, yeah. you know, which... Uh, really just uh, took the blessing away from the people because God was trying to show the people through Nebuchadnezzar, through Daniel to Nebuchadnezzar, what he had in mind, what God had in mind as far as what's going to be happening in the future of this world system. Yeah. Nebuchadnezzar in his self-centeredness made the whole image himself, you know, not showing all what God is going to do. So I pray that as we study the scriptures, we won't get blindsided and get narcissistic and think that, uh, that we are all of that and, and miss what God has for all of us to do and be a part of. Because sometimes we can get to the point to where we get so holy until God, I've got it made, you have wrapped me up in this thing and, 
And uh, I, I know there ain't no, you know, you know, no other way out of it. I, I've got it down pat yep. and miss what God is trying to say. And that would be a sad thing, you know, especially when he's trying to reach out to you to use you for his purpose. So, so in, in looking at this, uh, uh, it's important that you see what God is trying to say to us. Uh, I'm trying to move through this as, not as fast as I can, but uh, expeditiously as I can so that we can see, and because there's so much that we can get out of this, and especially when we get over into uh, into the ninth chapter, and tenth yeah. chapter, and so yeah. forth of Daniel, and then over to Revelation. Yeah. Now we stopped off in chapters uh, chapter seven and verse four, where we were talking about the four great beasts, and and, and I did make some copies of the examples of what these beasts would look like uh, as, 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 they were, uh, as they were identified. The first one would be as God talked about uh, the, uh, the, the picture of the, uh, the lion. You know, that, that, that was the first scene, this lion that had uh, four wings. Now, that, that, that's a horrible thing to look at, but what God was saying is that this lion being probably the most, well, not probably, but the most ferocious of the, uh, you know, of the uh, beast that you would see, because they, they would just tear apart and just, just take over everything. And real lions, you know, in the wild can grow uh, humongous, even to where they can take on a bear and tear him apart. You know, they can be the most ferocious thing. But we see this bear as Daniel is showing to Nebuchadnezzar and, and, and uh, uh, he has specific uh, uh, attributes. So the lion represents Babylon and its most famous king, Nebuchadnezzar. That, 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 was, that, that was what it was representing. Nebuchadnezzar uh, uh, and, and, and Babylon. Uh, the lion symbolizes the strength and power of the kingdom and the wings uh, symbolize the swiftness of the victories that, uh, that Babylon had as they fought, over, fought and took under their control of the nations. Okay, now that was the first, that was the, the, the first uh, image that, uh, that Daniel is showing that's popping up in chapter 7. Now he's gone through this before as he presented the, uh, the, the, huge, uh, the huge image with the head of the image being of gold which represented, uh, uh, represented Babylon and, and uh, it being the greatest of all nations and, and to this day uh, in retrospect to the size and the area that they had conquered still being the greatest of any nation that has ever existed. Babylon is still the greatest. And even in the book of Revelation, it speaks of a people will be crying in the last days when they see Babylon being destroyed. Babylon in a certain way will revisit itself uh, on, on, on this earth. Uh, and it gives the, the picture of Sparkling lights, color lights, uh, the whole city in, in, in beautiful array of lights uh, almost gives you a picture of uh, what would be uh, Las Vegas if any of you all have been there. You know, uh, even from out of space when they show uh, pictures of, uh, of Las Vegas area, it's, you, you can tell it from any other part of the country. It's all lit up even at night. Well, in the book of Revelation, it says that they, they will see this and they will be having fun and just, just uh, feasting and partying. And then all of a sudden, in, in a moment, in, in a day's time, in a moment, Babylon is destroyed. It's destroyed. And they start to moaning and groaning, you know, oh, and wailing out, Babylon, oh, Babylon, you know, just, just weeping for Babylon because they've gotten so used to its, its, its wares, to its prostitution, to its gambling, to all of the vices that the world has, 
uh, centered in this, in this area. Now, I'm not saying this is going to be Las Vegas. That's not what I'm saying. I'm giving a picture of how Revelation is, is picturing it. You know, and, and when, when God brings his wrath down on that great city, because what he's upset about is it represents a hoarder to where it has drawn all of his, not all of, but, but his people to it to, be, to get all engulfed and involved in, in the prostitution of it and the gambling and, 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 and all of the evilness that this society had to offer. It had, a, it had lured God's people into it and God was extremely angry and he starts to put in his wrath, throwing his wrath down on it and he destroys it. And even as he destroys it, there are going to still be those moaning and groaning, you know, we want it. They still will not turn and yield to God. And while God is trying to show himself, he is still, um, uh, he is still, uh, they are still not wanting to see what God uh, is doing. I'm trying to figure out, what are you handing out, Sister Cheryl? The old stuff, the old instruments. Oh, oh, the old stuff? Oh, okay, all right. There we go. Very good. So, but, but the head of the, uh, the image is the head that represents Nebuchadnezzar and Babylon. Now, in chapter 7, God is revisiting again because he's getting ready to move into the, in the, in the uh, positioning of what he's going to be doing to the whole world. He's shown who's going to do what to whom. So now he's getting ready to move into how they're going to do it and when they're going to do it and for what purpose and that kind of stuff. Okay, so he moves on in chapter 7 and the first beast that he sees uh, coming up is the lion with four wings. Now, the second, the second is going to be the bear. Now, this bear is kind of unique in the sense that it is closer to the time that we're, we're living. As a matter of fact, there is a nation that has taken on the, uh, uh, the symbolism of this bear out of Daniel 7, uh, Daniel chapter 7, verse 4, and that's Russia. Russia has made itself appear as this bear, this big, humongous bear with, with three ribs in its mouth, saying that as it goes and conquers, it's going to devour whatever's in front of it. And there's nothing that's going to be, stand, be able to stand in its way. Now, guess where the symbol of this bear out of Russia really pinpoints down to be the actual symbol and flag of what nation do you think that is? Can you give a guess thinking of Russia? Ukraine. Ukraine. Now, that should start to take, you know, getting your mind moving a little bit because not, and, and, and I, uh, trust me, I am not saying that God is coming next week or we're this close or anything else. Uh, I'm showing you how the Bible is laying out uh, the prophecies and so forth, and God's prophecy will be coming true. But, but here we have Ukraine right now uh, being uh, invaded by Russia, trying to annex this nation to it because, uh, because of their desire to become a member of the uh, United Nations. And the reason why that is so important and so disastrous to Russia is that here they would have a, a huge country on their border, on their border that would be uh, uh, familiar or, or be uh, sympathetic to the United States. So it would be just like having, like where Cuba is that's Russian, that, that is communist right on our borders, to have a nation that, that, that is uh, obligated or that is uh, uh, United States Senate right there connected to their border. Now, 
it, it is so important to Russia, to Russia would really consider going into World War III and into a nuclear war before it would give up voluntarily uh, Ukraine uh, to, to, to go back to governing itself. So what it does, what I'm getting at, the importance of the scripture showing out that one of these nations that's going to be so disastrous in the end times and God is showing the symbol of this huge bear with the ribs in his mouth happens to be a nation uh, that, that carries that as part of their symbolism and I think part of their flag, if I'm not mistaken, but I know it's their symbolism. Ukraine. And, huh? Ukraine. And, and it's Ukraine and it's happening right now and, and, and we teeter on the, on, on the edge of nuclear war because yeah. Putin himself has said that before he gave up, before he would give it back, uh, he would go into a, a nuclear exchange. That's what he said. That's how crazy mm -hmm. this man is, that he would go into a nuclear exchange. Now, now what good it would do? None, because if he went into a nuclear exchange just to fight out those that are in Ukraine, it's going to you know, kill its own nations because the effects of that is so close, it's going to destroy them. But they already went through a Chernobyl, so I guess in their sense, they can figure that, well, we can border this off and keep on kicking. Uh, we didn't shut down because of Chernobyl. Remember the disaster, the nuclear disaster there? The worst in history, matter of fact, is recorded as being worse than uh, Hiroshima back when they dropped the atomic bomb during World War II. So, so Russia has the mindset that it would go on with nuclear annihilation and not even think twice of it. But our trust is into, with God, that, that God would not allow such things to happen until he's ready for it to happen. But the beautiful thing about it, what I want you to understand in all of this, as we look through all the prophecy, what God's promise is to his children, that we would not be a part of his wrath being, being displayed. So no matter what happens in the, in, the, in the annals of history, no matter what happens in our present, no matter how disastrous things may be, God, I don't know how he'll do it, but he will not have us to be suffering in the midst of it. He will in some way uh, remove his people, uh, protect his people, or either cause it not to happen, even though it may teeter on the edge of, of it happening. Uh, so, but, but, but even still, this world system boasts knowing that, that Daniel chapter, uh, chapter, uh, chapter 7 you know, is really talking about a disaster of this world, and they boast on being a part of it. Yeah. That's what's so scary about it. Instead of being being uh, afraid or concerned or, or being spiritually uh, cognizant, they take this information and put a badge on themselves and, and boast, this is us. You know? And, and that's, that, that's scary. So what does that say to believers? That, that we, we pray even more fervently we, we, we recognize that God is in more and more control. So let's look at the bear. Now, the bear is a picture of, of Medo-Persia. Now, when we look at the, the, the main chart that we put out from chapter 2 of Daniel, the Medo-Persians were the, were the nations in the silver. That was the chest part. The head part of this image of gold was Babylon uh, with Nebuchadnezzar being king. The, uh, the chest part was of silver, which God said would be the Medo-Persians, with, 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 with Cyrus, King, king Darius, I'm sorry, uh, uh, leading uh, that, uh, that empire, and it would conquer Babylon. And they swore out no way Babylon could ever be defeated. And, and on a physical basis, Babylon could not be defeated. God had strengthened that nation to the point to where they were invincible. But because of their disobedience to God, 
the more that Daniel tried to show them who God was and show them how powerful God is above them, above their gods, above their kings or anything else, the more that they, 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 they snuffed at him, the more that they poked fun at him. As a matter of fact, you remember when the night when Babylon was overtaken, they were in, their, uh, in the palace having a party. King Belshazzar was having a party and he sent uh, his servants to the, uh, to the storehouse to get the golden chalices and, and utensils to bring back to the party so that they could pour their wine in and drink it out of it. Again, throwing their face up against God, knowing that these, these utensils, these golden chalices and so forth, was taken out of the temple when they raided Jerusalem. And God, that night, in one night, had this lesser kingdom, this lesser empire, come walk into the into the uh, into the palace, and 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 all of the all of the leaders of uh, of uh, Babylon was there. All of the princes, the pre the presidents, the generals, all of the all the leaders of, of the military, they were all there, drinking and getting drunk, and they were drunk and passed out. And uh, God saw fit for these, this lesser army to come in, you know, un, not, not even a battle, and kill er, every one of them that was in, in, in the palace. So uh, they, they took over that nation in one night. That was a lesser kingdom that Babylon said could never, never, ever conquer them. Which puts it in your mind that no nation should ever sit up and say they're so great that nothing can happen to them. That's right. God says, I'm the one who sets up and I'm the one who tears down. That's what he tried to tell Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar wouldn't believe it until the last part of his life. But he did come to grips with God showing him that. And, the, and even today, that still stands today. We as this country... We need to be on God with recognizing that, that we're not all powerful because we are Americans. You know, because we are slowly giving up our powers a little bit by little bit anyway. You know, uh, the, the strength of our, of our military is, is falling all apart. You know, when, when you have uh, pacifist people that are want to put, put, put roses in the, in the muzzles of rifles and want to just just hug everybody and, you know, and, and all this stuff, instead of being strong like God would have it to be. L let, let me give you, let, let me give you a little bit of history. When we come down to the, to the, uh, really when we come down to the fourth part of it, but this is to say how we can give up our own power in a certain sense. Do you know what was the, the main cause of the Roman Empire to be overtaken? History records, records. what is it? Homosexuality. Homosexuality. Yeah. It, it had gotten so rampant in, in, in the nation. It was almost a way of even greeting each other. It was just openly done. I mean, it, it wasn't even considered sex in a sense. It was, just, it was just open. Homosexuality was what you wanted to be. If you weren't a homosexual, then you were not even considered part of the Senate or part of the Knesset, or part of, of any, not the Knesset, Knesset is Jew, uh, Jewish, but a part of the Senate or any part of government, you had to be homosexual. And, and history is right that, that, that it was so rampant that there, there, was, there was nothing as, as, you know, there that was strong enough to really offset the attacks that rushed that uh, Romans, that Rome started to gather. And eventually they fell down because of that. But it's also in, in, in history, if you would read it, that every single nation that has ever been of, of, uh, of any importance, of, of any strength, that homosexuality was part of what caused their demise. It was part of what caused their demise. And that's something we can't overlook if we believe that history, you know, we learn from history, you know, saying, well, history ain't going to repeat itself. That's not part of it, and this kinds of stuff. 
but that's what history tells us. And it shows us that, that, that God is quite concerned about that. You know, you can say what you want to, and y'all can drag me out of here by saying all oh, this as the pastor, but this is, I just truly believe it from God's word. That there, there, there's very few things that God says that is an abomination to him. Very few things. I think there's only maybe two, maybe three things. One of them is homosexuality. God said it will not stand in his presence. We cannot fix his word and start to being so lovingly. I know I'm on the air. We cannot be so lovingly until we can, can excuse it or embrace it or bring it in. That, that, that God says, I despise it. I hate it. It's an abomination to me. And he says that eventually I will turn them over to their own yeah. desires, to their own, you know, and eventually those desires will lead them to destruction. That's what God says in Romans chapter 1, if you want to read it. It's, it's there. And, and, I, and I do not stand to make any excuses for any of that. But that's what God says. That's what God says. Even though the Bible is being rewritten and has been rewritten, to take those kinds of comments out, believe it or not, so that we can be more loving, we can be more inclusive, so we can be more whatever. But God has tried to show us examples. Sin is like leaven or like yeast. Now, we in today's time, everything is instant, all that, you know. You, but in the days when I was a kid, when you really had to make bread, Part of it was putting yeast in it, and and I and I remember clearly when Granny would would do her dough, and she would just put a pinch, not even much as a pinch, of yeast, cause the yeast would come in little packets no bigger than that that you could cook for about a couple of months, you know, on it, and put it in, leave it overnight. I mean, the, the dough would be about like that, and you come back in the morning, and it would be coming all out of the bowl. It, it would just grow and grow, you know. And so the Bible gives that as an example. When sin, when sin comes in, touching sin or close to sin just expands it. Sin has no other desire than to kill and destroy. You, you cannot take a barrel of rotten apples and put a good apple in it and make that barrel of rotten apples good. It won't happen. Right. Will not happen. It's impossible to happen. But when we look and, 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 and allow God to, to, to be the one to keep us away from the rotten apples or from the destructions of sin, then we can grow and be strong and develop as healthy like God would want us to be. But, you know, this world system who is guided by Satan doesn't want that doesn't want that you you know so but but anyway <laughs> back to what we we're talking about so we talked about the lion who, who, who represents the head of the uh, of the image and then we talked about in verse uh, verse 5 the bear who is the Medo-Persians Okay, and then in verse 6, we talk about the leopard. Now, the leopard, and I also have some images of that. Of the leopard. Yeah, of the leopard as well. These are just depictions. I mean, we don't know really how Daniel saw this, but just the description that the Bible gives would give you this, this picture of that. Now, the leopard, again, is quite interesting because the leopard, it, it, it does depict, depict, depicts Greece. Now, Greece is the third uh, part of that, uh, of, that, uh, of that image, the Grecian Empire. But look how this, this leopard is described. This leopard depicts Greece. Uh, though naturally a swift animal, the leopard had four wings in addition to its native agility. Uh, this speaks of the lightning speed with which Alexander the Great uh, conquered the ancient world. But on top of 
this this leopard being already fast and his 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 agility, his 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 cunningness, his ability to to conquer and so forth. Even though he had all of those, uh, it, it it also uh, really showed his downfall. His downfall it represents the four heads that you see on that leopard. Because when Alexander the Great had conquered everything, had conquered all nations that was around him. As a matter of fact, history writes that, uh, well, I don't want to worry about that. Anyway, after he had uh, conquered all the nations around him, his inner circle, his four mm -hmm. generals, mm -hmm. started fighting among themselves, splitting up the empire that they had accomplished. The empire that they had built from all of their conquering because of their wanting to be uh, great o over this and great over that, you know, they, they, weren't, they weren't satisfied in just being just plain generals part of the great Roman Empire. They wanted their own stuff. And so here's what you want to keep in mind. What the Bible is showing here that God was showing Daniel depicted the image. I'm trying to think. Because uh, this was like 640 years before Christ. And then from Christ to, uh, to the tearing down of the temple, of, of, uh, which Rome tore down the temple was 8070. So that's Six, say 650 years plus 70 years is what? 700 and how many? 720. 720. Okay, then from 8070, and I think uh, Rome was finally destroyed, was finally destroyed, uh, graces of life, round about. 17, 1700, 1600, somewhere about that. So what I'm getting at, here you're talking about 2,000 years. Let's just use that as a, a number. 2,000 years before it actually happened, hear God saying what's going to be happening. I mean, and it happened exactly like God laid it out to Daniel so far in these visions. That's something to really put in your mind. If you're looking for a God truly to worship, we worship God, Jehovah, who is the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm saying that because he's shown truly just by his word alone how accurate he is in, in history before stuff even happened. Yeah. Not accidentally, not pieces and not parts of it, right exactly to the point. And, and that's really what I want you all to get a grip of. That, that's really what I'm trying to show you. I'm trying to, to, there is no way to prove to you that God is. There is no way to prove to you that Jesus Christ is who he is. Okay, no way to prove to you. But I'm taking a route to show you that from what we have from written history, from biblical history, using exactly what we know for a fact has happened in hundreds and thousands of years before it happened, and exactly like the Bible said it would happen, you, you, you can't say it, it's an accident. Um, you, 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 you get what I'm getting at? You, you, you've got to even say God is who God says he is, or the Bible is a lie, or, or some, some excuse that you got to come up with. But, but, but it's not going to fall correctly other than the fact of saying that God is who he says he is. And God has the, the innate ability to tell us what's going to happen. I don't care if it's tomorrow or 2,000 years or 4,000 years from now. Doesn't matter. God is in control. God is who he says yeah. he is. And I want you to, to grab a hold of that. 
Because the only way that you can get to a point to where you can truly put your trust into God is to know that he is who he says he is. When he says that I am that I am to whomever that seeks me, that's exactly what he means. God is for you exactly what it is that you are needing yeah. of him. God is, is who he says he is. And knowing and believing and coming to grips with the fact of knowing that he is who he is, then, then, then we can go under the knife having surgeons to, to operate on us with us not knowing what's going on, trusting that there's someone who's awake that's over here. Mm. You can get to the point where you go grinning. You can go there grinning, can't you, Sister Scanlon? Go there grinning and knowing that God is in control of it. I'm telling you. And, and seriously have no second thought as to whether whether it will or whether it won't or whatever. Because knowing that whatever God works out is going to be the best yeah, yeah. that can be. Oh, yeah. you know. So that's where I'm trying to get you with this. And, 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 and hey, we are nowhere close. When, 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 when we show you when God deals with Daniel, I'm, and I'm not going to do it like I did last week. I ran all over the place. But when we started looking at what God deals with Daniel in the ninth chapter, yeah. and, and when we're talking about a whole lot of years, I forget exactly how many years now. We, we, we'll get there. We, I'll remember. But right to the very day that he prophesied or he gave the, the vision to Daniel to the exact very day that the, present, uh, the uh, uh, presentation of the Messiah presents himself. Yeah. Puts no question in your heart who the Messiah is. Yeah. None. Leaves out all the questions that anybody could have. If you're looking for science to fall along beside biblical history to identify your Savior, That'll do it. If you're looking for mathematics or, or, or astronomy or anything else that will consist of sciences, anything that you may say that I got, you know, I, I, I'm an intellect, I got to see something, to, this will lay it out for you, the vision that God gives Daniel to identify the Messiah. But, the, but God doesn't stop there. He doesn't stop there. He goes even further than that. Not only will he identify his son, identify without a question who the Messiah is, he will go on further to show you what the Messiah will be doing and how he's going to bring the kingdom into fruition. The kingdom that we're looking for. Yeah. The thousand year millennia yeah. that Christ will come on this earth and rule where we will rule with him. That's going to be a time like no other time, my brothers and sisters. First of all, a thousand years to where there is nothing evil that's on this earth. But there will be us who are born again in our resurrected bodies, in our glorified bodies, to where we can move from one place to the next at the speed of thought, where we'll be, be ruling with Christ. Christ will be sitting on the throne of David. And, and there will be people still on this earth that, that are in flesh like this that I'm sure will be envying us, of course, because here we are, you know, uh, like Christ, ruling with him. But, you know, it's, 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 it's a time that, 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 that is, is more glorious than we can ever think of, that we can ever think of. That's all in the planning for us. God lays all this out to Daniel. So we move on. Now the fourth beast is the one that I really want you to be scary of. Because he's yet to come. The other three have come. The other three have come on this earth. Now because the, the lion is the one that was, was uh, seen uh, during the time when, when Daniel, you know, 
was 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 uh, had these dreams or, or that was uh, fulfilling the the vision. So the lion is already there. That was Nebuchadnezzar. Well, not Nebuchadnezzar. That that was uh, really Babylon is what is representing. Uh, so that that has already been and gone. Okay, the uh, bear has already come and gone. Because the bear represented the Medo-Persians, which, which uh, is really, when you look at around about Turkey, which is around about where Russia is now in a way, so all of that goes hand in glove. But that prophecy has come and gone because the Medo-Persians did overtake the Babylonians and conquered them. That's come and gone. The, the, the leopard has come and gone because they have come and they took over uh, the, uh, the Medo-Persians and, uh, and, and conquered uh, Greece. And so now we're talking about this fourth beast. Now, this fourth beast has how many heads? Well, he has what? Ten horns. Ten horns. Okay, he has ten horns. And the part that we would be scary of is that little horn. Now, the ten horns of the, that this beast is going to be composed of, as we look into prophecy, or the, or the 10 um, European nations that makes up the, uh, the European or the, the, uh, the EU, okay? But what's gonna happen is that all of these nations, that's yet to come, all of these nations will come together as one big union, just like we're the 48 or 50 states mm -hmm. of the United States of America, all of these 10 nations of the European nation will come together. They're going to be powerful, They're going to be extremely powerful, okay? But then this little horn <coughs> pops up, and it's the way that it's being described is going to, I'm not going to pass this one out, this is kind of scary. It's going to be like a dragon of sorts, and these, these horns are going to be be horrible. They're, they're going to be able to destroy whatever they want. They're going to be in control of the world. They're going to come together and have their, their power established. But the little horn is going to be the Antichrist. So, an, the Antichrist. Now, here's what's so scary about the Antichrist. He, he comes, and that's why he carries the, 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 the emblem of the, of the little horn. Is because he's, you know, you ain't gonna pay much attention to him. He's no, no big deal. He, he's coming. He's going to be flamboyant. Uh, the Bible describes him as, as a man, but with no desire for a woman. You know that that gives you, that's how the Bible puts it. So it gives you a view, of a little bit of what his thoughts are. He's going to be very handsome and very. Charismatic people are going to love him. They're going to be able to draw to him. Just, just you know, just just draw to him. And he's going to come, and he's going to make 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 a uh, a pack. Yeah, out of all of these years that the children of of, of Ishmael, which are the Arabs, yeah. and the children of Isaac, or I, Isaac, yeah which are us, yeah. the Christians and the Jews or whatever, have been fighting each other for thousands of years. And you got all these other factions, all these other factions of, of the Ishmaelites that are all over, and, and nobody's been able to get them together to come under one, one, you know, one, one thought. You know, and a good thing they don't because there's so many of them and so many factions of them, if they ever got together with one thought in mind, they could literally take over the world with no question about it because there's so many of them, so many factions of them. 
But with, with all of them, every president, practically every nation have tried to, to make peace with them and specifically make peace between them and the Jews. And it's never been able to be done. So here this, this Antichrist, who this charismatic thing that's going to come. As a matter of fact, the Bible calls him the, the son of perdition, yeah. which I think I mentioned last week. There are only two, yeah. two people that have been called the son of perdition in Bible. One of them is Judas Iscariot, and the other one is the Antichrist. Um, but he's going to come, and he's going to make a pact with with these, with these, uh, uh, with these nations behind him, with these ten nations behind him, strengthening him. Now, the sad thing about it, in all of this prophecy, uh, as we have searched it and searched it, and I have searched scripture, searched scripture, this country don't seem to be nowhere in it. That, that's that's what bothers me as to where this country is going to be. But it's nowhere in the midst of any of this 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 uh, prophecy or description or whatever. But in a way, the anti the antichrist is going to to make a peace, and uh, the one thing that's going to foster that peace is the idea of the Jews being able to build their temple on the Temple Mount, which right now the most holiest thing that the Muslims have, which is uh, not Mecca, but what is it called? The or the the dome of the uh, of the rock is what it's called. The most holiest place that they that they have is where the temple was, and it's right over to where uh, the uh, the the ark was, where the all the sacrifices were being made. There is no way that that temple can be built until that dome is removed. But this Antichrist is going to be so charismatic and so flamboyant and so smooth talking until he's going to make a deal. But it's only going to be short, short lived. It's going to be short lived. For three and a half years, uh, there's going to be peace in the Far East. As a matter of fact, there's going to be peace all over the nation, really all over the country, because he's going to be, be, in, be in control of it all. He's going to allow the Jews to rebuild their temple. Don't know, it doesn't say anywhere in scripture that the dome is going to be torn down. I don't know how that's going to be done, but the, do the dome has to be removed and torn down because it's got to be built in that spot. Now here's what's scary. Okay, all of this says, okay, Dr. Gregory, that's good prophecy and good this and good that and the other. But if you Google, or if you've been listening to the uh, international news, the Jewish people have already started putting together the, the garments and the utensils and everything by the original uh, uh, descriptions that God gave, uh, uh, in, in gave Moses in the Old Testament. They've already started to, to building that. They've already started to, to uh, sewing and putting together the, the garments of the priest priesthood and, and they're putting all this stuff together all of this stuff together there's even there's the one thing that, that hasn't been proven yet but they say that it, it is that they know where the Ark of the Covenant is because that Ark has to be there, there can't be no substitute they can't rebuild that uh, the, uh, the the animals that need to be uh be there to be um, killed and the blood to be used for the cleansing of all the things that go in that temple they have to be there are specific kinds of animals uh, specific kinds but guess what they have already done they have been what, what is it called when you they have been cloning and cloning and cloning and they have come to where they have they've developed the Pure the animals uh, that's required uh, according to what the scripture uh, describes that they will sacrifice to take the blood to cleanse the, imp the implements of the temple all of that's in place all of that's in place the only thing that has not happened yet 
is that little horn. Is that little horn. But don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Because that's where we come in. Because all of this does not start to happening until after the church has been raptured. We will be in heaven when all of this starts. We will be in heaven. But what I want to show you is that in the Old Testament, God is laying down the pattern and has already laid down the pattern to reflect exactly what's going to be happening in the future. And that's where we have to be, you know, be ready and on guard for. So that's what all of these animals are showing. And the last one, the one with the ten horns and that one little horn, that's the one that we're going to be talking about as we go further in, in, in the prophecy, that little horn. As a matter of fact, well, we, we'll describe it even a little bit further as we go on. It, it, it gets more interesting and more intriguing as we, we go further in it. But what I want you to see is that all of what you have heard of and seen on TV and, and, and looking for to happen in the future and coming, it has already happened. It has already happened. And it happened to Daniel. And Daniel records all of that in the book of Daniel. And also we'll see here the last part of Daniel. God told Daniel to write all of this, but, but keep it sealed until a day that God releases it. That's why all in the years past, you haven't heard too much about the book of Daniel, the, the pieces in the book of Daniel. God has kept it, kept it quiet, uh, mysteriously, until a time such as this, which also gives us an insight that, that he's not too far around the corner. That is not to, to scare any of us. It's really to make us excited, those of us who are truly children of God, that, 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 that our God is, is ready to come get us before he gets all of this mess going. So whatever you see on news, don't, don't be afraid. Trust that God is in control of it. Don't be afraid of what Putin is hollering about. Don't be afraid if, if crazy, uh, what's his name, gets back in office. And, 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 and don't, don't be worried about that. Put your trust in God, because God has all of them under his control. Ain't none of them greater than he is. And ain't none of them can change the course of what God has prophesied for the future. Just trust that God is in control. Father, thank you again for the moments that you give us to, to study this great uh, prophecy. Uh, there's a lot here, and God, we, we don't want to scare people. We don't want to overwhelm, but we want to present just enough for them to see what you have in store and for them to see your accuracy in, in prophecy. Bless us as we study this. Keep our hearts focused on your Holy Spirit so that we can truly see what your word is trying to say to us. Bless us now. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Brothers and sisters, I want you all to know that uh, the gospel is what keeps us together, keeps us prepared, and keeps us not being destroyed by anything that this world presents. He protects us. But there may be some that, in the hearing of my voice, that, that don't know the Lord Jesus Christ. If you don't know Christ, then you don't know his Holy Spirit. If you don't know Jesus, you're, you're just here hoping for the best. Hoping for the best is not going to bring the best. What you need is the Lord Jesus Christ in your life. With him in your life, then you can be assured that the protector is with you. And that's his Holy Spirit. If you don't have never asked him to come in your life and save you, then you need to do so. You must recognize that there's no way to, to the Father because of our sin problem. There's no way that we can make amends to that. God is not going to accept the fact of us saying that when I get in front of him, I'm going to let my good outweigh my bad. Or, it won't work. It won't work. The only thing that he's going to be looking for is that, do you know Jesus? And if that answer is no, then there, that, that's it. There is no second choice. 
But the one thing that you will do after he, he tells you that that's the end is that you're going to have to bow your knee and finally say, you know, uh, recognize Jesus Christ as who he is. He says, every knee will bow and profess that I'm God, that I'm the Lord Jesus Christ. Do it while it makes sense. Do it while it makes sense. Because when a time comes when you have to do it, it's not going to account for anything. If you don't know Jesus in the pardon of your sin, then the Bible uh, clearly asks that you would open your heart and let him in. If he's knocking at your door, just let him in. Well, we've done what God is asking. There's still room at the cross. God bless you. Have a wonderful week. Uh, I pray that I don't get too excited over, over walk stuff with you. I, this is one of my favorite books. My favorite books. And because, believe it or not, this book of Daniel is the book that I really, truly got a grip to, like, for a fact, knowing that Jesus Christ is really, truly the Messiah. Further than just like receiving it faithfully or whatever, that when the, laid, when the Bible laid it out and, and I saw it, it like opened my heart and said, there is no other answer than Jesus Christ is the Messiah. He is the one. You know, I pray that that would be the same to you. It's one thing to know, but it's, it's another thing to have your hand on it and say, without a doubt in my heart, I know with a dying breath that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. Yeah. Amen.